Section Eight of the Book of Halloween by Ruth Edna Kelly. Chapter Eight. Halloween beliefs and customs in Scotland and the Hebrides. As in Ireland, the Scotch Ball Festival of November was called Samhain. Western Scotland, lying nearest Tara, centre alike of pagan and Christian religion in Ireland, was colonized by both the people and the customs of Eastern Ireland. The November Eve fires which in Ireland either died out or were replaced by candles were continued in Scotland. In Buchan, where was the altar source of the Samhain fire, bonfires were lighted on hilltops in the 18th century, and in Moray the idea of fires of thanksgiving for harvest was kept to as late as 1866. All through the 18th century in the highlands and in Perthshire, torches of heath, broom, flax, or ferns were carried about in the fields and villages by each family, with the intent to cause good crops in succeeding years. The course about the fields was sunwise, to have a good influence. Brought home at dark, the torches were thrown down in a heap, and made a fire. This blaze was called saunagon, of rest and pleasure. There was much competition to have the largest fire. Each person put in one stone to make a circle about it. The young people ran about with burning brands. Supper was eaten out of doors, and games played. After the fire had burned out, ashes were raked over the stones. In Aberdeenshire, boys went about the villages, saying, Gee is a peat to burn the witches. They were thought to be out stealing milk and harming cattle. Torches used to counteract them were carried from west to east, against the sun. This ceremony grew into a game, when a fire was built by one party, attacked by another, and defended. As in the May fires of purification, the lads lay down in the smoke close by, or ran about and jumped over the flames. As the fun grew wilder, they flung burning peats at each other, scattered the ashes with their feet, and hurried from one fire to another to have a part in scattering as many as possible before they died out. In 1874, at Balmoral, a royal celebration of Halloween was recorded. Royalty, tenants, and servants bore torches through the grounds and round the estates. In front of the castle was a heap of stuff saved for the occasion. The torches were thrown on. When the fire was burning its liveliest, a hobgoblin appeared, drawing in a car the figure of a witch, surrounded by fairies carrying lances. The people formed a circle about the fire, and the witch was tossed in. Then there were dances to the music of bagpipes. It was the time of year when servants changed masters or signed up anew under the old ones. They might enjoy a holiday before resuming work. Children born on Halloween could see and converse with supernatural powers more easily than others. In Ireland, evil relations caused Red Mike's downfall. For Scotland, Mary Avenal, in Scots Monastery, is the classic example. And touching the barn, it's weel ken she was born on Halloween, and they that are born on Halloween whiles see mar than other folk. There is no hint of dark relations, but rather of a clear-sightedness which lays bare truths, even those concealed in men's breasts. Mary Avenal sees the spirit of her father after he has been dead for years. The White Lady of Avenal is her peculiar guardian. The Scottish border, where Mary lived, is the seat of many superstitions and other worldly beliefs. The fairies of Scotland are more terrible than those of Ireland, as the dells and streams and woods are of greater grandeur, and the character of the people more serious. It is unlucky to name the fairies, here as elsewhere, except by such placating titles as good neighbors or men of peace. Rowan, Elm, and Holly are a protection against them. On Halloween all traditional spirits are abroad. The Scotch invented the idea of Samhainach, a goblin who comes out just at Samhain. It is he who in Ireland steals children. The fairies pass at crossroads, but the night is Halloween, lady. The morn is hallow day. Then win me, win me, and ye will, for I will, I wot ye may. Just at the murk and midnight hour, the fairy folk will ride, and they that wad their true love win, at miles cross they mun bide. Ballad of Tim Lan. And in the highlands, whoever took a three-legged stool to where three crossroads met, and sat upon it at midnight, would hear the names of those who were to die in a year. He might bring with him articles of dress, and as each name was pronounced, throw one garment to the fairies. They would be so pleased by this gift that they would repeal the sentence of death. Even people who seemed to be like their neighbors every day could for this night fly away and join the other beings in their revels. This is the nick to Halloween, when other witchy may be seen, some of them black, some of them green, some of them like a turkey bean. A witch's party was conducted in this way. 
the wretched women who had sold their souls to the devil, left a stick in bed, which by evil means was made to have their likeness, and anointed with the fat of murder babies flew off up the chimney on a broomstick with cats attendant. Burns tells the story of a company of witches pulling ragwort by the roadside, each astride her ragwort with the summons, Up, horsey, and flying away. The meeting place was arranged by the devil, who sometimes rode there on a goat. At their supper no bread or salt was eaten. They drank out of horses' skulls, and danced, sometimes back to back, sometimes from west to east, for the dances at the ancient Baal festivals were from east to west, and it was evil and ill omen to move the other way. For this dance the devil played a bagpipe made of a hen's skull and cat's tails. The light for the revelry came from a torch flaring between the horns of the devil's steed, the goat, and at the close the ashes were divided for the witches to use in incantations. People imagined that cats who had been up all night on Halloween were tired out the next morning. Children make of themselves bogies on this evening, carrying the largest turnips they can save from harvest, hollowed out and carved into the likeness of a fearsome face, with teeth and forehead blacked, and lighted by a candle fastened inside. If the spirit of a person simply appears without being summoned, and the person is still alive, it means that he is in danger. If he comes toward the one to whom he appears, the danger is over. If he seems to go away, he is dying. An apparition from the future especially is sought on Halloween. It is a famous time for divination in love affairs. A typical 18th century party in western Scotland is described by Robert Burns. Cabbages are imported in Scotch superstition. Children believe that if they pile cabbage stalks around the doors and windows of the house, the fairies will bring them a new brother or sister. Kate pulling came first on the program in Burns's Halloween. Just the single and unengaged went out hand in hand, blindfolded to the cabbage garden. They pulled the first stalk they came upon, brought it back to the house, and were unbandaged. The size and shape of the stalk indicated the appearance of the future husband or wife. A close white head meant an old husband, an open green head a young one. His disposition would be like the taste of the stem. To determine his name, the stalks were hung over the door, and the number of one stock in the row noted. If Jessie put hers up third from the beginning, and the third man who passed through the doorway under it was named Alan, her husband's first name would be Alan. This is practiced only a little now among farmers. It has a special virtue if the cabbage has been stolen from the garden of an unmarried person. Sometimes the pith of a cabbage stalk was pushed out, the hole filled with tow, which was set afire, and blown through the keyholes on Halloween. Cabbage broth was a regular dish at the Halloween feast. Mashed with potatoes, as in Ireland, or a dish of meal and milk holds symbolic objects, a ring, a thimble, and a coin. In the cake are bake a ring and a key. The ring signifies to the possessor marriage, and the key a journey. Apple ducking is still a universal custom in Scotland. A sixpence is sometimes dropped into the tub or stuck into an apple to make the reward greater. The contestants must keep their hands behind their backs. Nuts are put before the fire in pairs, instead of by threes as in Ireland, and named for a lover and his lass. If they burn to ashes together, long, happy married life is destined for the lovers. If they crackle or start away from each other, dissension and separation are ahead. Three luggies, bowls with handles like the druid lamps, were filled, one with clean, one with dirty water, and one left empty. The person wishing to know his fate in marriage was blindfolded, turned about thrice, and put down his left hand. If he dipped it into the clean water, he would marry a maiden, if into the dirty, a widow, if into the empty dish, not at all. He tried until he got the same result twice. The dishes were changed about each time. This spell still remains, as does that of the hemp seed sowing. One goes out alone with a handful of hemp seed, sows it across ridges of ploughed land, and harrows it with anything convenient, perhaps with a broom. Hemp seed, I saw thee, and her that is to be my lass, come after me and draw thee. Burns, Halloween. Having said this, he looks behind him to see his sweetheart gathering hemp. This should be tried just at midnight with the moon behind. A spell that has been discontinued is throwing the clue of blue yarn into the kiln pot, instead of out the window as in Ireland. As it is wound backwards, something holds it. The winder must ask, Wa hoogs, to hear the name of her future sweetheart. Another spell not commonly tried now is winnowing three measures of imaginary corn as one stands in the barn alone with both doors open to let the spirits that come in go out again freely. 
As one finishes the motions, the apparition of the future husband will come in at one door and pass out at the other. Kale pulling, apple snapping, and lead melting, see Ireland, are social rites, but many were to be tried alone and in secret. A highland divination was tried with a shoe, held by the tip, and thrown over the house. The person will journey in the direction the toe points out. If it falls sole up, it means bad luck. Girls would pull a straw each out of a thatch in Broadsea, and would take it to an old woman in Fraserburgh. The seeress would break the straw and find within it a hair the color of the lovers to be. Blindfolded, they plucked the heads of oats, and counted the number of grains to find out how many children they would have. If the tip was perfect, not broken or gone, they would be married honorably. Another way of determining the number of children was to drop the white of an egg into a glass of water. The number of divisions was the number sought. White of egg is held with water in the mouth, like the grains of oats in Ireland, while one takes a walk to hear mentioned the name of his future wife. Names are written on papers and laid upon the chimney piece. Fate guides the hand of a blindfolded man to the slip which bears his sweetheart's name. A Halloween mirror is made by the rays of the moon shining into a looking glass. If a girl goes secretly into a room at midnight between October and November, sits down at the mirror, and cuts an apple into nine slices, holding each on the point of a knife before she eats it, she may see in the moonlit glass the image of her lover looking over her left shoulder and asking for the last piece of apple. The wedding of the sark sleeve in the south running burn where the three lards lands met, and carrying it home to dry before the fire, was really a Scotch custom, but has already been described in Ireland. The last Halloween I was a-walkin, my druket sark sleeve as you ken, his likeness came up to the house stalkin, and the very gay breeks o' Tam Glen. Burns, Tam Glen. Just before breaking up, the crowd of young people partook of sowens, oatmeal porridge cakes with butter, and strunt, a liquor as they hoped for good luck throughout the year. The Hebrides, Scottish islands off the west coast, have Halloween traditions of their own, as well as many borrowed from Ireland and Scotland. In the Hebrides is the Irish custom of eating on Halloween a cake of meal and salt, or salt herring, bones and all, to dream of someone bringing a drink of water. Not a word must be spoken, nor a drop of water drunk till the dream comes. In St. Kilda, a large triangular cake is baked, which must be all eaten up before morning. A curious custom that prevailed in the island of Lewis in the 18th century was the worship of Shoni, a sea god with a Norse name. His ceremonies were similar to those paid to Salmon in Ireland, but more picturesque. Ale was brewed at a church from malt brought collectively by the people. One took a cupful in his hand and waded out into the sea up to his waist, saying as he poured it out, Shoni, I give you this cup of ale, hoping that you'll be so kind as to send us plenty of seaware for enriching our ground the ensuing year. The party returned to the church, waited for a given signal when a candle burning on the altar was blown out. Then they went out into the fields and drank ale with dance and song. The dumb cake originated in Lewis. Girls were each apportioned a small piece of dough mixed with any but spring water. They kneaded it with their left hands in silence. Before midnight they pricked initials on them with a new pin and put them by the fire to bake. The girls withdrew to the farther end of the room, still in silence. At midnight each lover was expected to enter and lay his hand on the cake marked with his initials. In South Uist and Eriske on Halloween fairies are out, a source of terror to those they meet. Halloween will come, will come, witchcraft will be set a-going, fairies will be at full speed, running in every pass, avoid the road, children, children. But for the most part, this belief has died out on Scottish land, except near the border, and Halloween is celebrated only by stories and jokes and games, songs and dances. End of chapter 8. Read by Professor Heather and By. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.